Okay, and he was moved with compassion. <clears throat> well, this is a talk about compassion. What is compassion? How does this qualify, qual uh, quality change the way we form relationships with others? What are some examples of those in the scriptures displaying compassion and what might we learn from that? Is compassion a necessary quality in the new creation? One of the reasons I selected this subject is my own level of compassion. It's sometimes present and at other times, not so much. Compassion is a quality that stands out in the Bible, especially when reading the four gospels where Jesus was present. Time and again, Jesus was worn down from the large crowds following him, making requests of his healing powers, where he expended energy and vitality to offer help. Jesus showed an unwavering compassion for the downtrodden, the sick, and those lost in their way of life. He did not seek his own comfort and his own praise. His love was for others and not for self. He was filled with this quality of compassion. And as we know that Jesus told others, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father meaning the qualities Jesus exhibited were the same character qualities in the heavenly father. We read in Psalm 86, 15, but thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. God is a God of compassion. Simply defined, Compassion is an emotional response of sympathy. You feel sorry for others' distress with a desire to give relief. So we say compassion is a deep feeling of sympathy for someone who is suffering. And yet it is more than an emotion. It includes a strong desire to take action and alleviate the suffering. We see, we see this in Jesus' life as a man on earth. Jesus wanted to relieve the suffering of others. This was a foretaste of the kingdom. Jesus suffered himself as a result of his observation of and his experiences with the sufferings of others. He could see the effects of sin and its degrading influence, whether physically or mentally. We learn in Hebrews 5, verse 8, that though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Jesus learned what it meant to be compliant and submissive under adverse and evil conditions. He learned in obedience and observing the requirements of his father. The word compassion identifies actually doing something about feeling sorry, to be tenderhearted, to be sensitive and affectionate, to be moved inwardly and taking action. Even though Jesus suffered constantly for doing good, he showed compassion for others continually. Consider, however, the admonition for development of Jesus' true followers found in 1 Peter 2, 19 and 21, 19 through 21. For God is pleased when, conscious of his will, you patiently endure unjust treatment. Of course, you get no credit for being patient if you're beaten for doing wrong. But if you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. For God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in his steps. We think of ourselves as students of the Bible. We believe in divine providence. Not all, in fact, not very many outside our fellowship believe as we do regarding providence. 
Providence is defined as divine guidance or care. If you were, look, if you were to look into the Cambridge English Dictionary, you would find providence defined as an influence that is not human in origin and is thought to control people's lives. So some are skeptical with regard to providence, while others take an extreme opposite view and accept the idea of losing all free will and accountability. Some completely dismiss the idea that events and experiences are guided in advance. Others, on the other hand, believe so greatly that fate or karma is responsible for their actions and decisions, they're not to be blamed for anything that goes negative. Bible students understand divine providence is a reality, but we might question how can we measure its limits? Well, we start by believing God is good, so very good, and we all know that, we all believe that. God is righteous, God is love, God is compassionate. All his providences must be viewed as being wise, resulting in benevolent, caring, and compassionate ends. We observe too and believe that God made man in his own image with a morally free will and is cited in Genesis 3.22. And the Lord God said, behold, the man is to become as one of us, to know good and evil. The right to be free is valued by humanity as a crowning achievement in their existence, as testified by the many wars fought where lives were lost, protecting or seeking that freedom quality of life. And we know God is always consistent with his own plan, which he designed before the foundation of the world. We learn in Isaiah 55, verse 11, where God makes it known. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. For some time recently, I've been thinking on God's plan to save mankind from going too far into evil and crossing that line where an impossibility of reform results. If we can consider God's ultimate purpose, we can more easily accept his overruling providence, which permits an earthquake or a tsunami or a tornado, war or widespread sickness like the coronavirus because they're the means of accomplishing his eternal glorious plan. Indeed, to the world, this appears as unfair and cruel, but this does not mean compassion is lost because we know the outcome of his plan. And we know good people will suffer as well as those who are not good, but the big picture should remain in focus. Likewise, God's overruling of the affairs of nations to provide the largest experiences with sin and its consequences will prepare mankind for their willingness to accept righteousness and goodness. Look at the leaders in world government today. Can we trust what they say? Do politics control how decisions are rendered? Is corruption a stranglehold on progress? Can you imagine how thankful the vast majority will be to receive fairness in the true use of the golden rule in the millennial kingdom? We're told in Psalm 145, verse 9, the Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. Brother Russell reminds us in reprint 1560 that all men have sinned and therefore they're condemned to death. And as we watch the nightly news on television and are sometimes appalled at the lack of goodness and the sheer foolishness of some, I'm gonna read a paragraph from the reprint that might help to give understanding. Quote, the condemned world is thus left to its fate to reach the tomb by gradual or by hurried processes. Sometimes the death penalty is executed by the disturbances of the elements of nature. 
incident to its yet imperfect condition. Such, for instance, as tempests, cyclones, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, lightning shocks, and so forth. Sometimes by the aggregated results of sin entailed by inheritance. Sometimes by the sinful war of angry human passions resulting in wars and in private domestic feuds and revenges. And sometimes through the lack of good judgment in discerning and avoiding danger such as fires, railway, and ocean disasters. All of these are the executioners of the just penalty for sin pronounced against the whole race. And that's end of quote. We can praise God that we have been enlightened to see his compassion on mankind, even in times of trouble. Praise God for our being able to see the truth that identifies a loving creator, the choice to complete his creation the way he sees best. And to do this, I conclude as found in Genesis 1, verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. God's providences are based on three principles. One, God's divine goodness. He wants all to come to a knowledge and adherence of the truth and be saved. Two, God's wisdom in not violating mankind's free will. And three, his never changing ways. His plan will without fail be carried out and he wants us to know it. Mankind then is pretty much left on their own to pursue life. God does not interfere. And hence the creative abilities inherent in man and found in many are used to improve the human condition. Medicine, communications, technology, and transportation improvements are not only impressive, but aid in extending life and enjoyment. God, however, does not guide their course and is not responsible how man uses his ingenuity. Our selfishness often influences results, which can cause unhappiness, anger, revenge, and a whole host of negative fruits. God's far-reaching plan has been designed for everyone's ultimate good. And even though they are unaware, mankind will learn as a result of sin and misery in fact, the, the misery that the sin causes, to seek and trust God eventually. And as we know, even the wrath of man will praise him. But how does the prospective church consider providence? Those who have consecrated their lives to serve God and are being guided by his Holy Spirit. Providence does play a role in their lives. And we see ample evidence of this in God's word. Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. Luke 12, six and seven, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. First Peter 3.12, for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Hebrews 1.14, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them? who shall be heirs of salvation, Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love of God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Psalm 84, 11. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. 
we know any who have sacrificed the right to an earthly resurrection and are striving to serve the Lord in spirit and in truth are viewed by God as sons. I don't think I come close to realizing the import of that concept. That is to be a son of God. Galatians 4 verse 6 identifies the gift given to us as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. As sons, we are to be recognized of God as heirs of his favor through Christ. This is a reflection of God's great compassion on us. Imperfect creatures with free wills to fulfill his plan. Someday all will learn and achieve the proper attitude based on his principles. We who are the prospective sons of God can identify with his providences in our lives by considering the scripture in 2 Corinthians 1 verses 3 and 4. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us all in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we, comfort we ourselves receive from God. To be compassionate toward another can take a number of forms. For example, the scripture in Galatians 6, verse 2 from the New Living Translation reads, Share each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. Sharing another's burdens is a mark of compassion. There are many different kinds of burdens that one who is compassionate can take notice and have a desire to relieve. Certainly, there are burdens of bereavement. Burdens of business or family difficulties. Burdens of mental suffering. Of course, burdens from physical suffering. Burdens from real or perceived anxieties. And perhaps the greatest burden from real um, burden of all is that from acknowledged sin. There are times in each life of the consecrated where sorrow is present or the perplexity of life is great, and a yearning for the sympathy of others exists. The compassion for others is how the law of Christ is fulfilled. A sympathetic contact based on love with a desire to relieve the burden, relieve the suffering. And hence, there is a necessity of fellowship, a need for one another in the body of Christ. Compassion can be expressed to others in a general way, in how you act and the relationship you have or desire with others. I'll try to give an example with a story. The author writes, a teacher friend of mine was teaching math to a class of six-year-olds, a number of whom were recently arrived refugees from other countries. The topic was fractions. My friend, my friend defined what a half and a quarter were, and then asked the children to write down whether they would prefer a half or a quarter of a chocolate bar. As she walked around the room, she noticed that some of the new students wrote that they would prefer a quarter of the chocolate bar. My friend thought she would have to reteach the lesson, as they didn't appear to understand that a half was bigger than a quarter. She asked the students why they would prefer a quarter of the chocolate bar, and one little girl replied, so that more people could have a piece of chocolate. The author cried when she heard that. It reminded her how beautiful humanity is if we take a moment to notice it. This story illustrates a willing sacrifice by young children in a natural way for the good of others. This is compassion in everyday thinking. 
And we know that the children were refugees from different countries that had experience in perhaps not having as many material goods or luxuries. Even though they were young, their experiences taught them compassion and a desire for others to prosper at their expense. As a prospective church, do we not have compassion on our fellow humankind? Is not our sacrifice used for the good of others? Are we not being trained to exhibit compassion? And are we not especially empathetic and merciful toward those who share or have shared a similar experience as ourselves? Here's another real life experience where support was offered to someone who did not want it. Now I have a blank slide here, so uh, we'll just proceed this way. A woman, a woman writes, early in my career, I had a male boss who would sit in his office and yell at his female secretary instead of walking to her desk to speak to her. Finally, I went to her and shared that I was sorry she had to put up with his behavior and that it was not right. Instead of thanking me for my compassion, she told me it did not bother her and it was fine. I did not understand at the time, but I was trying to provide empathy and compassion to someone who did not want it. I'm now more aware that a person has to be ready to receive empathy Otherwise, it comes off as pity. I think true compassion is knowing how and when to offer comfort to those around us. It is not always received in the spirit it is offered. This is an example of compassion being rejected. How does this story coincide with the training of the church class for the coming millennial work? And can we learn something? Well, I appreciate two paragraphs from reprint 5603, and that reads, if the children of God do not carefully cultivate the quality of justice, they'll get themselves into that attitude where they will not appreciate justice at all. But while appreciating what is right and what is wrong, we're to go further and see that we cultivate diligently the quality of love, sympathy, charity. None can say that his own estimate of what constitutes justice and love is entirely right, and that the other man's estimate is entirely wrong, especially when this other is a brother or sister in Christ, seeking to develop the same Christ-like qualities as ourselves. Our viewpoints cannot be always the same. Therefore, let us not be too sure that our own viewpoint is the correct one, and the other view wrong where there is any possibility of our being mistaken. No follower of Christ is so well developed that he can say, I do not need any further instruction along the lines of justice and love, but my brother needs it. And in our experiences <clears throat> with the brethren, where the other one seems to be at fault, let us say to ourselves, here is a brother who perhaps has had more disadvantages than I have had. He is a brother of mine, according to the spirit. He seems to me to be doing wrong, but I emphasize with him because he probably does not know that his action is wrong, or I may be wrong myself. If he saw the matter from my viewpoint, he would do differently. I will not judge him, but leave that for the Almighty, who is infallible in judgment and to whom judgment belongs. It is good we have compassion and concern for others, even if it is not appreciated. We cannot read the heart. However, you might recall the example of the Israelites, God's people, rejecting God's compassion quite often. One such, such example was Zedekiah, who became king of Judah at 21 years of age and reigned from Jerusalem. Scripture tells us he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He refused to humble himself before the prophet Jeremiah, who the Lord sent to advise him. Zedekiah was stubborn and hard-hearted. He refused to listen. 
as a result of Zedekiah's attitude, the chief priests and people continued to be more unfaithful as they followed pagan practices of those in surrounding nations. Second Chronicles 36, 15 and 16 tells the outcome. The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent word to them again and again by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they continually mocked the messengers of God, despised his words and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people until there was no remedy. We recall Nebuchadnezzar's armies either slew or took captive to Babylon, the Israelites, burned the temple and destroyed Jerusalem. Compassion is difficult to give when the one who needs reform, as in this example of Zedekiah, displays unworthiness. We recall too the warning that the Israelites received when they demanded a king. They as a nation would have the decisions of the kings be their decisions. Yet God is truly compassionate in his long range plan of salvation and particularly compassionate on his people who have evidence of their desire to serve and obey him. The apostle Paul gives advice to those of the spiritual Israelite class in Colossians 3, 12 and 13. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Compassion indeed is a necessary quality of those in the church. I think about visitations at funerals. Typically, we're all faced with sadness and mourning, even more so if the death was unexpected. Loved ones are grieving and experiencing a severe trial. They did not need advice at that time. They need compassion. We have the example of Job in the scriptures, receiving advice from his friends rather than sympathy and compassion. As Job says in chapter six, this was like food without salt or the tasteless white of an egg. In other words, comfort from his friends that had no comfort. We need others to share the sorrow and provide stability on our behalf, showing the concern for our good. They grieve because we grieve, showing their love and regard for us. And this provides comfort because we realize they're trying to relieve our suffering. As expressed in Ephesians 4.32, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Compassion can be shared on different levels. Here's a poem that was written by an old woman living in a nursing home in Ireland. It was found among her things after she died. This poem to me is an example of understanding compassion through shared experiences. I'm not gonna uh, have anything on the screen so that you can use, use your uh, mind's eye to visualize the message. What do you see nurses, what do you see? What are you thinking when you look at me? A crabbed old woman, not very wise, uncertain of habit with far away eyes, who dribbles her food and makes no reply when you say in a loud voice, I do wish you'd try. And forever is losing a sock or a shoe, making life difficult always for you. Who unresisting or not, let you do as you will with bathing and feeding the long day to fill. Is that what you think? Is that what you see? Open your eyes, nurse. You're not looking at me. I'll tell you who I am as I sit here so still. 
as I use at your bidding and eat at your will. I'm a small child of 10 with a father and mother, brothers and sisters who loved one another, a young girl of 16 with wings on her feet, dreaming that soon now a lover she'll meet, a bride soon at 20, my heart gives a leap, remembering the vows that I promised to keep. At 25 now, I have young of my own who need me to build a secure, happy home. A woman of 30, my young now grow fast, bound to each other with ties that should last. At 40, my young sons have grown and are gone, but my man is beside me to see I don't mourn. At 50, once more, babies play round my knee. Again, my, again, we know children, my loved one and me. Dark days are upon me. My husband is dead. I look at the future and shudder with dread. For my young are all rearing young of their own. And I think of the years and the love that I've known. I'm an old woman now and nature is cruel. Is her just to make old age look like a fool. The body, it crumbles, great and vigor depart. There is now a stone where I once had a heart. But inside this old carcass, a young girl still dwells, and now and again, my battered heart swells. I remember the joys and I remember the pain, and I'm living and loving life over again. I think of the years all too few gone too fast and accept the stark fact that nothing can last. Open your eyes, nurse, open and see. Not an empty old woman, look closer, see me. What do you think about this woman? Do we view her with compassion? Certainly from her eyes, she observed little or no compassion from those who were paid to take care of her. What thought provoking sentiments were expressed by one who was older, that the memory recalls earlier times when vitality was great and many of the current experiences of her nurses were likewise her experiences. And she recalled these even at her advanced age. The writer expressed a desire for the younger to realize she too was no different than they in what life taught her. Experiences are the Lord's great instructor. Those now young will someday be older and wiser and perhaps wonder why they are possibly ignored or misunderstood. We all need to learn from those who have gone before. Leviticus 19, 32. <clears throat> Stand up in the presence of the aged, show respect for the elderly, and revere your God. I am the Lord. Job 12, 12. Is not wisdom found among the aged? Does not long life bring understanding? I can imagine the great athlete now up in years, whose name is recorded in the record books for great production or accomplishments on the field or in the stadium. But his fame is gone. Younger fans do not recognize him or appreciate his skills. They do not know him. Yet in his mind, he often relives his glory years, but now he receives little or no credit. Maya Angelou, an American poet, singer, and civil rights activist, said this. People will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. Think back in your own life. I believe you most likely have memories that go back even in childhood, when someone you can vividly recall did or said something that made you feel a certain way, happy or shamed or depressed or accomplished, a strong feeling which you recall this day. Here's what Helen Keller said. Life is an exciting business and most exciting when it is lived for others. Here's what Ralph Waldo Emerson said. 
You cannot do a kindness too soon, for you never know how soon it will be too late. And here's what Pablo Casales said. He's a famous cellist, composer, and conductor in Spain. I feel the capacity to care is the thing which gives life its deepest significance. What do these quotes have in common? They all deal with relationships. And you can see the relationships are based on doing good for others. To be compassionate, we have to have an ability to recognize when others are suffering. These skills include being more attentive, more affectionate, being more appreciative, and being more accepting. Relationships with our coworkers, with our neighbors, with our families, with our spouses, and especially with our brethren can be rewarding and fulfilling, but they can also challenge us. I certainly admire those who practice compassion and are moved to take action to aid and support others. In our mind's eye, we can project the end of our life and use that to think of our relationships, especially of those who are close to us. We can use our lifespan as a way to look back. How do we want our relationships to be remembered? As we look back, do we have regrets in our decisions and the results they have had on our relationships? Is there fear others will reject us because of the way our relationships developed? Is there anger or resentment that hampers our compassion? Do we try to control others to be a certain way or have others think of us as superior? Can we really be compassionate with all that is going on in the world today and the fast paced changes in people and society? Will this increase or lessen our involvement with others? Will this make us more aware of others? And as, as discussed previously, you know, do you have it, do you care enough to act? When our own needs for love and concern are not met, our compassion can fall off. Think of Jesus, what he endured of the opposition to demean him, to insult him, to embarrass him, yet he still had compassion. His concern was for others. He suffered and died to save all sinners. You too have a part in developing your character to be like his, to have compassion on both the deserving and undeserving. We read in Zechariah 7, verse 9. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment, and show mercy and compassions every man to his brother. Well, we have uh, several examples of compassion from the Bible that we can discuss. And of course, we start, started this talk with Jesus as our example uh, of one displaying great compassion. And there's a scripture in Matthew 9, 36 that reads, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep with no shepherd, having no shepherd. Jesus' miracles, as we can imagine, attracted many. And the people were more interested, I believe, in his healing than maybe listening to his message. But that did not stop him. Even though bad things were said about him in, in chapter nine, some terrible things were said. But Jesus described the people as scattered and weary. The guides or the shepherds, the guides or shepherds the people had were the scribes, priests and Pharisees. They were ineffective in bringing the people to God. And when we think of the glory that Jesus left uh, when he was with the Father and as a perfect, uh, with a perfect spiritual existence, we're taken back to see G Jesus' generous attitude toward others at his own loss. This is a character that truly defined love. Shortly, Jesus will control the whole resurrection process. He will display compassion on all nations and peoples. He will continue to display compassion to the race in the millennium as long as any need or desire help. 
Jesus noted that there were so many that were in this condition without a shepherd that we have the scripture in Matthew um, 18, 23 to 35. Oh, excuse me. That's not correct. Uh, Matthew 9, 37 to 38. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is truly plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into his harvest. And his intent was to give them part of his uh, spirit, part of his power to go help the relief, the suffering of the people. And that is what he did. And we have a second example of compassion, and we're all aware of this one. It can be found in the parable of the unmerciful servant. And that's found in Matthew 18, 23 to 35. And you recall an earthly king decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. And one servant had borrowed a considerably large amount of money, but could not pay. And this is where the scripture comes in. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. And the master of that servant was moved with compassion. He released him and forgave him the debt. The king showed compassion by allowing him time and opportunity to keep his word. But when the king heard that the servant had unmercifully abused and refused compassion and extension of time to one who owed the servant money, and it was certainly a far less sum, the king was incensed. He took back his mercy, he canceled the extension, and he put the servant into jail. So what might this lesson be? And I think it's that our Heavenly Father would be indignant to have given us forgiveness through Christ. Should we not show compassion and mercy on our fellow servants to forgive them their trespasses against us? Matthew 7, verses 1 and 2 says, Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And I see, brethren, I'm almost out of time here. I had two more uh, examples. One was uh, David and Jonathan, both, you know, they agreed as younger men to take care of the other's family should something happen to one of them. And we know that uh, David showed great kindness and uh, compassion to, and I have trouble with this name, and he, maybe you do too, Mesobo Seth, uh, who was uh, Jonathan's son. He according to the scripture here, allowed him to eat at the king's table and gave him back all the property that his grandfather Saul had. So he honored his commitment and um, at the same, same time showed uh, extended compassion. And then of course we have the um, Good Samaritan. We all know about this one. Um, you're a, a Samaritan, not even a Jew helped uh, a Jew when the Levite and the priest walked by showing compassion for a complete stranger. And so there's a lot of lessons in that. But I'm going to end this by saying compassion and love are closely aligned. Compassion is selfless. It can exist without any relationship at all. You do not have to know an individual or a group of individuals to feel compassion for them. Compassion does not demand anything uh, in return. That is why we can still feel compassion even when others are unappreciative or abusive. Compassion is unconditional. God's unconditional love we know to be agape love, and that was told us this morning uh, by Brother David. He loves his creation, the world, so great that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish. And you remember the Greek word for the world that God loves is cosmos, which 
includes not only the harmonious arrangement and the order of things, but the inhabitants on the earth, the men, the human family. And as further defined in Strong's outline of biblical usage, the ungodly multitude, the whole mass of men alienated from God and therefore hostile to the cause of Christ. Yet God has compassion on all, and especially you, the consecrated believer. A scripture that uh, comes into play is uh, 2 Timothy 1, verse 9. God has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Describing this in a slightly different way, our faith has allowed God's compassion to reach us before it is realized by the world. I'll close this talk with verse from uh, the New American Standard Version found in Psalm 4011. You, O Lord, will not withhold your compassion from me. Your loving kindness and your truth will continually preserve me. Thank you, brethren, and uh, may the Lord add his blessing.